Uh, welcome everyone. My name is John Worth. I chair the North Coventry Township Environmental Advisory Council and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series. This is actually the third series of webinars that we have hosted and this is the third webinar in our third series. So without further ado, I would like to welcome David Wise. David is the uh, Watershed Restoration Manager at the Stroud Water Research Center. If you're not familiar with the Stroud Water Research Center, I certainly encourage you to become uh, uh, familiar with it. It is a, a tremendous uh, local resource uh, that has done a lot of really good research on water, water quality. It's uh, uh, very, they're doing very important work. So with that, David, thank you so much for agreeing to come to us and, and present this evening, and I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, John. And I will, I served on my local townships planning commission for a number of years, and I will say hats off to the brave souls who come out on a weekday evening uh, for the good of their community. So I, I know the price that is paid to be active in our communities uh, for things beyond uh, compensation. And I, I commend you for it. So, so uh, I'm David Wise. I work uh, in the Watershed Restoration Group at Stroud Water Research Center. Happy to talk to you tonight about forested stream buffers, what, why, and how. Just a quick word on Stroud. <clears throat> Stroud is largely an academic research facility focused on understanding uh, freshwater ecosystems. There's about 35 PhDs and technicians who do this um, basic and applied research on aquatic ecosystems. And then there is an education group and a watershed restoration group who sort of round out the mission of the place. And I'm in the watershed restoration group. There's about six of us. We, uh, much of my time I spend working with landowners, often farmers, uh, providing resources to do the conservation they're willing to do if price isn't uh, unaffordable for them. Quick outline of where we're headed tonight. Uh, very briefly, what is a forested riparian buffer? Why they are important? And I, I hope I will share something that is new and different for you tonight on that second question. And then the third point, how to, how to establish forested buffers successfully. We've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, the, the team that I work on and Byrne Sweeney, our former director was doing this before then. So, so what's a forested riparian buffer? Um, riparian simply means near water. So a riparian buffer is a forested area near surface water. Uh, technically, if it's not at least 35 feet wide, it's not considered a forested buffer. It would be a use exclusion or it would be uh, streamside stream tree planting. 35 feet is a minimum to be considered a forested buffer. And with apologies to Texas, I will say for buffer restoration, bigger streams are not better targets in this, in this definition of a forested buffer. I just, I want to point out some of the attributes. Uh, buffers on small streams really are a phenomenal opportunity. They have bigger impacts on the stream. There is much less risk of flood damage. And frankly, there are many, many more sites available to be worked on. Um, if you were to look at a diagram of the streams on the landscape, uh, small streams, things that you can jump across, uh, make up about 85% of all the stream miles on, in the Eastern North America. And so that these really are the capillaries of the landscape. They are the places where the exchange of good things between the land and the stream and bad things between the land and the stream. It's that space where that, that interface space, that capillary sort of uh, network on the landscape. Uh, so the small streams really are important. And then while we're talking about buffer definitions, just a quick word about width. You're looking at a clip here of a journal abstract uh, that was published in 2014, and it was Dr. Byrne Sweeney and Dr. Dennis Newbold, two of our best minds at Stroud Water Research Center. They reviewed more than 200 academic papers. It took three years. 
And what they wanted to ask was, how wide should a forested buffer be? And they looked at these 200 plus papers and they specifically looked at eight factors, nitrate removal, sediment removal, um, the habitat dimensions that I'll say more about later on, channel erosion control, temperature control to keep streams cool, woody habitat, macroinvertebrate health, the bugs that live in the streams and fish health. So they looked at, to optimize all of these eight factors, how wide should a buffer be? And the conclusion they reached is that a 100 foot buffer per side is a desirable and defensible uh, sort of um, width. So if you were in a township context and were to experience, for example, a legal challenge to a buffer ordinance, there's good science. And this, this journal article is part of that uh, to say that, hey, 100 feet um, per side is a scientifically defensible buffer that you're not being arbitrary and capricious. Um, what's wrong with this supposed buffer? Well, it's too narrow and there's too few trees. <laughs> and the tree that's in there is not native. So. Um, this is about three miles upstream from a public water supply, and there is no chance that the agricultural chemicals being applied to keep, uh, keep the pests out of the corn, there's no chance that that is not being consumed by the consuming public further down the pipeline. Uh, that buffer is simply not nearly enough to, to do the job society needs it to do. So. So second point in the outline, why forested buffers are important. Uh, you guys are here with an interest in forested buffers and an interest in the environment. Um, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time touching on many, many things that you know to be benefits from forested buffers. Um, so the, the Swiss army knife, uh, the for <laughs> a buffer does everything. It, it cures the croup, uh, it relieves dysentery, it will cure baldness. There's, you know, buffers will do everything we need them to. Uh, so you've seen many of these, you're familiar with many of these. I do, I do believe that our society does need to sit up and take notice in a particular area of buffer modality, in a particular area of buffer action. The green arrows represented on this buffer uh, allude to the filter or the barrier, the filtration function of buffers that we all know. And there's hundreds and hundreds of studies on this question of buffers as barriers. What I want to, what I want to offer to you tonight as a new insight um, is that buffers transform the stream that they surround in ways that multiply the ecological services that the stream itself is providing. And as such, they are uh, more than barriers. They are more than filters. Uh, our former director, Bern Sweeney, I said, Bern, on a, on a as best you can scale, give me a sense of how much work buffers do for water quality by this multiplying of in-stream ecological services, in-stream ecological processes, as opposed to just their filter barrier. And he said, David, he said, it, it is really hard to know and it would depend on the parameter. He said, but I would say for nutrient and uh, common agricultural contaminant processing, probably the in-stream functionality is on par with, or perhaps slightly exceeds the filter barrier function of the buffer. And I just, I was a student of water quality from my undergraduate years through graduate school years. I was in my thirties at the Stroud Water Research Center in the audience, my first hearing of this. And to learn that these processes are being multiplied to that extent was something completely new to me and I was, I was dumbfounded by that. So maybe that's something new for you. So that was published in September, 2004, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That was the seminal article that Stroud published on this topic. 
And in short, here's the, here's the science that they did. This is a, a diagram of an aerial view of woodlots in Chester County, Pennsylvania, um, and the, the stream systems that flow in and out. Um, so here is a, if you can see my cursor in the middle of the screen, here is a stream in a deforested, this would be a meadow reach of stream. And then it enters a woodlot, and then it flows through the woodlot, and then it goes back out of the woodlot on down and enters another woodlot. So there, our society has created this de facto experiment on the landscape that the Stroud scientists simply capitalized on. Say they looked at this section of stream, for example, and they quantified what was going on in the stream. Then they looked at this section of stream and they quantified those characteristics. So they could say, okay, so here's the difference it makes whether you have uh, trees on the banks or whether you have grass on the banks. And here, here is a quick nutshell summary. What difference did it make whether there were trees on the banks of those streams versus grass on the banks? And we're talking here about healthy grass buffers, not um, loafing lots for heifers like I grew up with here in Lancaster County. These are gentlemen farms, um, horse farms with good, good sod, good, good grass buffers. So what did they find? They found that the forested streams were 1.5 to three times wider than the meadow streams. And I'll come back to that and explain why that is and why that matters. Those forested streams were up to two and a half times slower. The water's taking longer to work its way down the stream, meaning it has longer residence time, meaning it has longer time for the agents of pollution remediation to do their magic. This one was dumbfounding to me. The forested reaches have up to five times more biological activity, just total biological behavior. Just there's five times more life, more creatures, more critters. That leads to the sorts of environmental services up to nine times more nitrogen uptake. This is one of our main water pollutants in the rich agricultural landscapes that we live in and, and, urban, is, and urban and suburban as well. Um, up to nine times more nitrogen uptake, up to two and a half to five times more phosphorus uptake, and up to three times the atrazine. Atrazine is a agricultural pesticide. Up to three times the atrazine degradation of the non-forested areas. So these, in, in, a set, in essence, these forested reaches, areas of streams that have trees on their banks are doing phenomenally more work for our society than areas that do not have uh, trees on their banks or have, have healthy grass buffers on their banks. So why is that? Why, is the, why are these forested reaches so much more functional and productive? And significantly, it has to do with energy. Um, Diatoms are one of the common photosynthetic organisms in streams. They need shady conditions. They're essentially microscopic ferns in the stream. Uh, they are a small percentage of overall food energy in a stream, but a really high quality food, food source. For example, mayflies, a lot of the scraper mayflies, this is a, a really important uh, and, and high quality food source for them. But it's a small percent. So yes, there are green photosynthetic organisms in the streams uh, doing that work. Where else is energy coming from? Solid carbon from trees. In healthy streams with, with trees, um, solid carbon from the trees is a major food source. Think of it as, uh, if you are familiar with agriculture and silage, silage um, is simply dead plant matter that has food value. Um, think of it as sauerkraut, uh, it is dead plant matter that has food value. So there's leaves, twigs, and pollen. Uh, streams being wet depressions in the landscape, they collect five times more leaves than the equivalent areas of forest floor. But that said, even, even despite all that, this is only still about a third of the stream's available energy to be productive of ecological services. And what you're looking at here in the photo this is called a leaf pack. So these, these leaves, as the stream flows down through, they just stacked up there. Um, and by the time uh, 
February, January rolls around, those leaves have been consumed by a whole host of stream organisms that uh, rely on them for their food source. So the main source, however, is not diatoms, it's not leaves and other solid carbon. The main source to drive a productive ecosystem in a stream, you're looking at it here in the photo, and it is watershed tea. It is dissolved organic carbon, um, and it is uh, two thirds of the energy in a stream to make it a healthy and productive system is coming from dissolved organic carbon. This dissolved organic carbon is a food source for microscopic organisms, particularly some species of bacteria, beneficial bacteria. They turn it into themselves. They are in turn consumed by microscopic animals, which are in turn consumed by slightly larger animals called macroinvertebrates, which end up being consumed by fish and on up the food chain. So a healthy system is driven by this watershed tea. Um, and if you uh, look at the color of that water, uh, that is tea colored and that is from the dissolved chemicals coming out of that forested landscape. And that is a rich soup of food for those organisms in there. This was completely unknown to me till I was in my mid thirties. I'm just dumbfounded that I could have gone through Penn State and Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin in science institutions studying, trying to study streams as best I could. And nobody told me this. I had to come to Stroud to learn this. So energy is one reason. Uh, the other reason why these forested sections are so much more productive and vibrant is better habitat. Uh, if you are a, an organism that lives in a stream um, you are hanging on for dear life to the stream bed because if you don't, in two days time, you will be in the Delaware estuary, the Chesapeake Bay, and you will be dead because your habitat will be completely inhospitable to you. So stream organisms have to cling to surfaces and clean surfaces and abundant surfaces really become critical. There's also, and I will challenge you, um, observant souls, on the landscape, I will challenge you to see if you can see this for yourself. Forested streams have more habitat. They not only have more and better energy, they not only have a better bottom habitat, they simply have more habitat. So here's a stream just upstream of our lab outside of Avondale. Um, and it is on the order of 15 to 20 feet wide. And if we go uh, 200 yards upstream, this is the same stream. And the grass is exactly responsible for this disappearance of two thirds of the stream ecosystem. The grass vigorously grows roots into the water. Those fine roots trap sediment. The grass roots into that sediment. And until the shear stress of the water and the high velocity that it creates in that narrow pipe configuration, until that shear stress is enough to strip the sediment out, the stream will keep getting narrower. So you can um, reverse this by planting that stream and the stream will widen out again, just as you saw in that prior photograph. So what is, what is going on is we have essentially lost two thirds of the functional stream bed habitat from Eastern forest, or sorry, from the Eastern region of the, of the United States through deforestation. Um, it is simply the case that forested streams because of, because of shading out the grasses that narrow streams, forested streams are wider and have more habitat. So I work with a lot of farmers and I throw this at them. I say, hey, if you give a herd of Holsteins um, more and preferred foods and you give them better uh, conditions, you don't heat stress them, you don't cold stress them, you don't leave them out in the rain, better conditions. And you give them larger pastures with larger populations, larger herd size, they're going to be more productive. That herd is going to be more productive and make more milk. In the same regard, on the right side, a photomicrograph of a bunch of bacteria, the invisible herd 
given its preferred food sources, like that watershed tea from native trees, and given better conditions, the right temperature regimens for their existence, and given more habitat, wider streams with more area per 100 meters of stream, uh, that invisible herd, like the, like the Holstein herd, they're gonna produce more of what they make, but in this case, they're making clean water for society. So it really, this was a major milestone in my learning about streams was that trees transform streams to be far more productive of the services that our society relies on them for. So two, two quick corollaries. If you extrapolate what this means for our society, so if this is how a stream works and it really functions based on dissolved organic carbon driving the whole thing to be productive, how far from a stream can you plant a tree and have benefits to that stream? And the answer is as far as water flows, because as wherever water flows from a tree, it will be carrying dissolved organic carbon in that flow path through the soil uh, across the soil in the shallow groundwater into the stream. Uh, so uh, where, where can you plant a tree and do good for a stream? Anywhere. And then uh, this one is really technical, fish grow on trees. So if, if you follow, if you were to trace back the carbon molecules in that brook trout, and that's a beauty, um, if you were to follow those carbon molecules back you would find that they have come out of the forest that this stream is embedded in and that the very carbon molecules that make that fish came out of the trees. And then the uh, last part of the talk, uh, how to successfully establish forested buffers. Um, so we've been uh, working at Stroud Water Research Center since about the mid 80s on this question of how to do trees better. And I, I learned late in the game when Bern Sweeney, our former director was receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay. Um, I learned during his acceptance speech that all the research he had done for two and a half decades on reforestation methodologies, he did on Saturdays and Sundays because he was too busy running Stroudwater Research Center as his paying job uh, as an aquatic ecologist, aquatic uh, entomologist, and you know, chair or operated the director of the whole facility. Uh, unbelievable. So we've been working at this for a while, and I stand on the shoulders of giants like Bern Sweeney. I don't know how many of us have done buffer restoration on a landscape that includes statuary. <laughs> so in the foreground, there's actually a couple of statues. This was a, a uh, landowner in Chester County, uh, and it, it happened to be a, a series of photos that uh, really illustrated well some of the, some of the things that I just want to make, make point to. So here is a fresh, it's, this is just being installed. You can see the install crew in the lower right, um, you know, putting up this forested buffer. As, as the photograph was taken. So about two years in, if you look closely, there are trees emerging from those tubes. Uh, the faster growers will be emerging the first year, the slower growers by certainly by the third year. And by about year eight, this is what you hope to see. This is a, a good successful buffer uh, with great maintenance uh, to keep those trees in a free to grow condition. So. So I'll take you through tips for success. You'll see this slide with certain sections highlighted in red, which is the, the point I'm making on a particular slide. Uh, so tips for success. Um, these, these really are not rocket science. Um, it really comes down to some uh, lived reality, lived experience. Select native species suited to the site. And I would say the most critical topic in species selection is soil moisture. Yeah, you got to pick the right hardiness zone, and you got to, you know, there's some other considerations that go into things. But really, at at the center of things is getting the right soil moisture. Um, there are a lot of landowners who are excited about having 
chestnuts and red oaks and white oaks and mass bearing stuff for deer and things. And many of these species just, just don't tolerate soggy feet and they don't thrive. Um, so this Chesapeake Bay Riparian Handbook has a huge, it's a huge resource for anybody who wants to really dive into this stuff. But a low risk approach is simply to plant, rather than dialing in the species to the exact site and having a planting plan that shows, you know, a silver maple here and a white oak up on the high ground at the very extreme of the buffer. We do production buffers. You know, we, last year we did uh, 60, almost 70 acres of buffers, um, tens of thousands of trees. We generally use a broadly adapted palette of species that when you put sycamores, river birches, swamp white oaks, silver maples, red maples, pin oaks, and black oaks, it doesn't matter whether you put them in soggy stuff or dry stuff. They will tolerate the entire range and you're just well served to not have to complicate life. And you can complicate life. You can use colored flags, figure out where trees belong, have a, a white, a white uh, flag that, that sycamore, uh, symbolizes a sycamore, you know, a red flag that symbolizes a red maple and have your crews and volunteers plant them that way. Uh, second tip, my strong recommendation is that you use a five foot tree shelter with a burst feature and that you simply leave those shelters on until the tree is six inches in diameter and is bursting out of the tube on its own. One of the tasks you will have is to keep those shelters upright until the trees are big enough for the tree to hold the shelter upright. But frost heave and deer strikes and floods have ways of knocking shelters down. And when a shelter is on the ground with a young seedling in it, uh, it will pin the tree down and the voles will move in very quickly, small native mammals, and they will eat the tree and you will not have success. So uh, which tube to use? Uh, this was a fool's errand for me. Um, back in 2007, I monitored uh, more than 2,000 tree shelters, took data on five farms, got my share of wasp stings and burn nasal uh, stinging nettles. Um, and what I found was it doesn't really matter if you use a well-manufactured shelter, any of the four that I'm illustrating here, you will have good success. I would say in, in our part of the world, a five foot tube is critical because of the deer populations. They protect trees in the early going from deer brows. They protect trees in the later going from buck brow. And in the lower left, you see a photograph of a tree that is bursting out of its shelter. That's exactly as it's designed to do. Uh, I do encourage anybody who is responsible for a planting to monitor trees. There are some trees that uh, possibly may struggle to thrive in a tight shelter sort of circumstance. Um, but we've had the, the general palette of species we use they'll burst out of them just fine uh, on their own. Uh, I would encourage you to use the center hole net method. These bird nets are to keep birds from going down the tube and dying down there. And if it's a several of them, they can produce enough ammonia in their decomposition phase that they can kill the tree as well. So it's a double loss, it's often bluebirds. So that net keeps the birds out. For many, many years, we saw nets being installed with a tassel center bottom don't do that. The, the chances are, in my experience, is that nets in the best of intentions aren't taken off in the right timing. And the result is they get, the leaders of the trees get twisted up like in that bottom right photo. And if you use the center hole method, we found out it'll reduce tangling by about 75%. Um, so it, you can, even if it's neglected, and I don't recommend that you neglect them, but if, it, if a net gets neglected and is not taken off, with the center hole method, the tree has a fighting chance to find its way out. Um, I would encourage you to leave the shelters on until the tree is six inches in diameter. This is heartbreaking. You know? So here's a four-year-old tree, four inches in diameter, and a buck has come along, and the odds are that tree is gonna die back to the ground. It'll send up uh, sprouts from the root collar. Um, whether those 
new stump sprouts turn into anything is, you know, they're all subject to deer browse and future buck rub again. Uh, so it's, it's heartbreaking. We had a landowner this spring with 11 acres of forested buffer, hundreds and hundreds of trees. He took off his shelters on three inch diameter trees. And by the end of three weeks, almost half of them were rubbed and looked like this. It was just, it's devastating because he, he laboriously took care of these trees for three years and he took his shelters off too soon and had a terrible disaster. So we did some research on this. Stroud, one of the, one of the fun things that I get to do as a sort of a science nerd is get to overlay some questions of research of tree of reforestation methodology. We get to overlay some questions on our restoration plots. So one of the questions we wanted to ask is, okay, for years since 2006, the, the best professional judgment was take the tube off when the tree is about two inches diameter at the top of the tube. Well, that turns out to be way too soon. So we followed trees. We, this first group, we followed the trees for uh, three years. We, when it got to be two inches in diameter, we fully removed the tube. We followed another group of trees that we took a case knife, we split that tube from top to bottom so it wasn't strangling the tree, wasn't tight, uh, but we left it on, we left it in place. And a third batch of tubes, we followed trees um, with shelter simply left in place. And here's what we found. So look at the gray bar. This is year three data, fully removed shelters, on the vertical axis is, is how many, what percentage of those trees got rubbed by deer? So by the third year, following removing that shelter, almost half of these uh, trees had been buck rubbed. And the ultimate mortality is not clear, but we had trees that were 15 and 18 feet tall that died back to the ground and produced stump sprouts in subsequent years. Whether any of those sprouts turn into any, anything meaningful for reforestation is an open question. So where we fully split the tube but left it in place, by year three again, we had about 10% of the trees rubbed and they were not rubbed as badly. They had much better chance of surviving and, and healing over again. And where we left that tube in place intact, simply sort of a neglect treatment we had exactly zero trees out of 426 uh, rubbed by deer. So that was a pretty clear data set and that is our guidance. And I've talked to people since then on how big the trees have to be before deer are done rubbing on them and doing damage. It's about six inches. I've heard that now from multiple people that under six inches, deer can still do damage and serious, put trees in real peril um, through buck rub. Next tip for success, protect, protect your trees from voles. Voles are small native mammals. They're critical ecologically. They're food for anything that flies, runs, or crawls. Snakes, hawks, foxes. Uh, I've seen great blue herons eating voles up in cornfields on my neighbor's field. Um, voles also happen to do a lot of uh, real serious damage to trees. And I have lost more trees to voles in my years of reforestation work than I've lost to deer. Um, for about two decades, this technique, this herbicide spot, three foot diameter around a sheltered tree, this has been the gold standard of how to do protection from voles. Voles are um, keenly sensitive to light levels. They will not go out into open areas for fear of being eaten. Um, and this is a very effective way to protect trees from bull damage. Um, this, this technique using stone mulch instead of herbicides is becoming our new standard method. And you know, we were interested in getting away from herbicides and this technique seems to be working uh, quite well and is, is meeting our demands. That stone is not any stone. It's not clean stone. It is a stone called 2A modified. So it's a mixture of real fine particles up through about one inch diameter particles. So this knits tightly together. There is no, 
there are no voids for the voles to go crawling in as you would get with like clean stone of you know inch or two inch size. It's simply Swiss cheese for the voles to run through. Uh, see if I can get this video to work. So this is not high tech stuff. So we get the stone on site with a skid steer. A fellow puts two shovels full of stone on, levels it off a bit. You're going to see him pat it down. You don't even need to pat it down. The next rainstorm will do that. So that's it. That's high tech stuff. Um, so we did the head to head trials. We did the science. We took sites where we treated trees and tubes with 36 inch herbicide spots. That's the gold standard for two decades. We treated another bunch of trees with a 20 inch diameter by two inch thick treatment of 2A modified. That's about 40 pounds of stone. That's a lot of stone and hauling that to the site is a job if you're gonna bucket it there with five gallon buckets. So we also wanted to ask, can we get away with less stone? So we did a 12 inch diameter treatment of two inches thick of that 2A modified. And then we had to wait and take data. Um, this, this spot got sprayed twice a year for four years. This stone got installed uh, and nothing more was done. I mean, we did, we mowed all the sites several times a year, uh, but there was no herbicide work done around these, these treatments. So here's survivorship data. Four years in, here's your 36 inch herbicide spot. We had 80% survival. Um, at the end of four years. That's, that's pretty decent. With the stone, we actually had statistically significantly better survivorship, the 20 inch diameter stone treatment, 90% survivorship. And then in the uh, 12 inch stone, the survivorship was essentially statistically a wash with the herbicide. There's a tendency towards not being as good, but not surprising. That's only a 12 inch free to grow area versus this cushy 36 inch free to grow area. So that's survivorship. So the trees are surviving really well with the stone mulch, as good as the gold standard statistically. Growth wise, uh, the growth of the stone with the 20 inch treatment is as good as the herbicide spot. And the 12 inch stone is not quite as good. That's statistically not as good as the herbicide. And for me, I'm not too concerned about giving away some growth. One of my besetting issues in our rich uh, southeastern Pennsylvania environments is trees that grow so fast that they wreck themselves. The top growth exceeds the strength of the stem and they flop over. And the mowing crew comes in and the trees are flopped over and laying on the ground. They've broken the tie, they've broken the stake, they've kinked the shelter. And the mowers say, what am I supposed to do with these trees laying on the ground? And there's really not a good fit. So I'm content to give away some growth. Uh, survivorship is a very different question. Um, so we came into this looking for a way to effectively grow trees that didn't rely on chemicals. What we didn't know is we were going to save money. Uh, so this 36 inch herbicide spot is almost a dollar per treatment for those eight treatments twice a year for four years. That's eight mobilizations. That's a lot of things to keep track of over four years in terms of workload tasks. The one-time treatment with stone mulch was about $3. It, this happened to be when I asked the contractor for a 12 inch ring, he gave me 15. He said, David, that's two, two full shovels. Don't complicate my life. He said, this, the stone is $6 a ton. We're not worried about the stone. <laughs> I said, Bill, I can live with that. So we do this one time. That stone is going to be present through and have benefits long after the herbicide work is done. So I'm curious to see if we can document, you know, benefits in years five through eight. Um, but this is where we are going. Uh, this is our standard practice is stone mulch now. Uh, the last two years, we've put in more than 130 acres of forested buffers with stone We've come, in and come across two downsides. Uh, we had one site experience two major floods. I mean, on the order of 100 years flood frequency or more or higher, um, it removed stone from about 5% of the trees. So we'll just follow up on those trees and do the herbicide spots rather than putting more stone down and risking another <laughs> 200 year floods back to back in the first two years. 
of the thing being installed. I don't know what the probabilities of that are, but uh, you got to you got to start asking whether there's sin in your life or something that's driving that. Anyway, um, the other site we had trouble with was access for delivery truck. We had one wet site that meant extra haul distance for the skid steer, and we had one other site where steep slopes made, meant that the truck couldn't get very close. It was a little bit inconvenient. Um, Wrapping up on tips for success, uh, mow the site at least once or twice a year for three to four years. Um, you know, and back to that earlier slide, you know, if, if you plant your trees on rows parallel to the stream in a curving sweep, it's not offensive aesthetically. And I, I have watched a, a fellow try to mow the buffer that I planted on a random pattern based on the landowner's insistence that I do that. And the poor fellow uh, was at his wits end trying to mow uh, a randomly planted buffer. He eventually got it done, but it's really inefficient. So you can then you know, figure out what mower is gonna be used to mow this thing and make your distance between those rows a multiple of that mower width. So either two or three times the mower width you know, for something that's efficient. So here's the meadow bowl, which I've termed the brown death. Uh, these guys have really done a lot of damage. If you mow, you're exposing them to predation. So mowing is a very uh, common treatment. You don't have bowls in most people's lawns because it's, it's manicured, it's mowed you know, down to a nubbin and these guys simply don't live in them. If you have waist high grass, knee high grass, you'll have bowls like crazy. These guys are everywhere. And this is the heartbreaking damage that they do. I've lost tens of thousands of trees to moles doing this sort of damage. The green death, this is a forester's term, the, the chance of finding a live tree in a tree shelter buried up to its chin in a competitive grass like this reed canary grass in this case, really, really slim odds of trees surviving. You know, this, is, this is, foresters have given uh, competitive grass is the term, the green death, because that's, that's the outcome. And then my last tip for you is in our part of the state, uh, we seem to be ground central for invasive species. Uh, everything from um, oriental bittersweet to mile a minute to uh, invasive exotic mulberries to a whole range of things, uh, multiflora rose. And there's a seed bank that's in the ground, but aside from the seed bank that's in the ground, the birds that perch on these tree shelters, they sit on the edge of these tubes and they defecate their seed load down the tube with a little fertilizer packet, thank you very much. And they're feeding on oriental bittersweet, mulberry, mile a minute, um, you know, all the stuff that you don't want in your tree tube competing. Because here is, in a two-year-old tree scenario, this oriental bittersweet got started and is actually more biomass of invasive weed than what the tree is in that shelter. And here's a uh, multiflora rose to boot. So we did some research some years ago, and this is where we've come out. Um, this is similar. It's a pre-emergence herbicide, a granule, similar to preem that people use on flower beds. It's a granular pre-emergence herbicide. You apply this before the weed seeds germinate and it messes up the enzymes that are part of the germination process. Doesn't hurt the trees that are already, you know, a foot tall to two feet tall when you plant them, the stuff that we're planting. We did this, followed the, the application instructions and we had all kinds of mile a minute coming through and we thought, oh brother, this isn't working. So we went back to the drawing board. We tried multiple products. We tried ex extra dosage. We tried multiple doses. And the research that we did over uh, three generations of research, we found that what we needed to do was two applications a year. One shake down the tube, walk past the tube, give it a shake like you're salting your French fries, put those granules down the tube. Do that in February, do it again in May, and we are weed free through August. Um, and if you've tried to remedy 
a tree that has an oriental bittersweet vine growing on it. It's, it's a dismal and, and fraught process and the odds of you having success with that that are gonna last are very slim. Uh, this this uh, pre-emergence herbicide thing has really uh, been a godsend for us. So wrapping up, the main threats to seedlings, deer, voles, invasive plants, especially the climbing vines, neglected shelter maintenance, a tube that's on the ground is not doing its job and it will lead to uh, voles moving in and, and wrecking the trees, and then competing vegetation. Those are my experience, the main threats to trees. Um, a lot of people ask us a lot of details that in our experience have not been critical whatsoever. They'll ask, what, what type of stock should we be buying? Should we, can we use bare roots? Can we use small container stuff? Can we use two gallon plants? Should we be buying bald and burlap stock? And the answer is, if you do an appropriate maintenance regimen, any and all of those stock types will be successful. It's far more about what you do after you plant than what it is that you planted. People have asked how to plant. You know, can we can we get away with volunteers planting with shovels? And the answer is yes. And if you have con access to contractors and augers and dibble bars and hoe dads, they'll also all work if they're done properly. Uh, sometimes some of these are easier to do. Like for example, if you're working with volunteers, having the holes pre-augered and using containerized seedlings is a sort of a foolproof way to get good success. Um, how many to plant? Uh, we, I plant about 125 per acre. I put more of my money and my budget into maintenance and site prep initially, getting the site ready to plant and getting the site taken care of after the planting. Less concerned about how many trees I have than more concerned about that they, that they thrive and that they live. A peer of mine at Stroud, insists he has to use 200 per acre. And you know that's his call and we disagree, disagree and that's fine. They'll both work. Uh, when to plant, fall's fine, spring's fine, they're both okay. Um, if you're gonna plant in spring, get them in by the end of April, unless you are figuring on possibly having a watering task. If, if May turns into a stinker and a hot one, uh, you can lose a lot of trees if they're not in by the end of April, so. Uh, and then just a last couple of comments, be persistent, you know, and be patient. Restoration takes time. Most of the work for a forested buffer is done in years one through four. So here's some aerials over time, uh, planting that went in 2008, you don't even see them. By 2012, you can see that there are trees on the landscape. And by 2019, so 11 years later, they're closing canopy. Um, and that's really encouraging. That's where we want to get to. So there is my contact information. Um, if there's things you want to follow up on beyond the Q&A that we're doing, going to do next, um, by all means, um, I'm happy to, to entertain those. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. That was that was really interesting. I, I, I was furiously scribbling notes, and I learned so much from, from that. But I mean, certainly uh, as people are thinking of their questions and, and typing them in, there are a couple of questions I came up with from listening, David. Um, so one of them was the, uh, the, the issue of, you know, that a, a hundred foot riparian buffer, you know, is scientifically defensible. Um, in subsequent research, has there been any, any, clear trend as to if there should be in those in the hundred feet from you know the stream uh, you know out through the barrier um, or the buffer any certain plants that are better for example close to the stream versus you know out out at a hundred feet or is it just a uniform anything wooded and shady is good yeah that's a good question and the, the art of planting is as much an art as it is a science. Um, sure. the, there are some contextual realities that, that come to bear. For example, um, if a stream is actively moving uh, and you're concerned about 
bank erosion. And I, I will say, I think our society is fixated on bank erosion in ways that are beyond healthy. Uh, streams move. Uh, that's that they've always done this. They will continue to do, to do it. Um, accelerated erosion can be a concern, particularly because we insist on putting infrastructure and human encroachments into what's really the stream's prerogative to meander back and forth over time across the floodplain. But you know where you are concerned about stream migration, to put a lot of very aggressive shrubs in that near stream zone, even putting live stakes on the face of the bank uh, can be an effective way to get a very high density that if, if you can get shrubs in that immediate bank environment that are thick, they will create enough roughness that like the grass that I talked about earlier, they will trap debris and you will get, um, you, will, you will get into a bank building as opposed to a bank eroding sort of context or at least slow down the erosion process. Um, for me, the other thing that is very common in, in buffer layouts is if I'm working uh, next to crop ground or next to production hay ground, I will try on the outside of the buffer to step down the height of the plants uh, so that I'm not putting a sycamore that's going to get to be 120 feet tall out next to the cornfield and create, you know, a, a 60 foot canopy over the that's going to be a problem for equipment, for shade, for growth. So I'll, I'll in the last three rows, I'll start step, stepping down to things that might not get any higher than 30 feet, then and not any higher than 25 feet. And then the outside mm -hmm. row, I'll be putting in shrubs that may top out at a dozen feet or 10 feet or something like that. Yeah. So that the, the shade essentially stays on the buffer, not on the production ground next to it. Um, right. So, and that can help with uh, that sort of a dense outer layer can help with the invasive managing invasives that, you know, as the light penetrates under the trees, you'll get more invasives because of the more sunlight. Uh, survivability of the new tree planting, we're told that 50 to 60 percent is the best you can expect uh, with that recommendation we see uh, sur sur with your recommendations. Would we see survivability you know, higher than that? Yeah, and, it, and uh, we've tracked about 7,000 trees that were planted uh, around 2016. And using the methods that I've recommended to you, whether it's herbicide spots or whether it is uh, the new stone mulch technology, uh, we will see survivorship in the low 90s through four years. When, when it is Stroud staff and Stroud contractors doing that maintenance and where we have the landowners doing it and we're simply doing checks, it'll be between uh, 82 and 92% survivorship through four years, just depending on how thorough they are and how, how uh, conscientious they are. So you can expect you know, 80 to 90% survivorship with the, with the sort of approaches that I've shown you. All right, question from Carol. Uh, I've seen river birches in three years old, three year old river birches in tubes in full sun be completely unable to remain uh, erect when removed yep. from the tubes. You know, so with a trunk diameter or with a, uh, with a trunk AB, uh, six to eight feet in height, they flop over onto the ground yep. bending like, you know, and okay, so you're, uh, how long does it, would it take for them to develop the, whatever they need to strengthen their trunks and remain upright. Yeah, and and Carol, this is this has been. Did, did I get the name right? Was it maybe yes. Karen? Okay. Anyway, Carol. oh yeah, Carol. There it is. Um, Carol, this is one. This is you put your finger on a great question. I've been working on research questions for about fifteen years now, and this is one that has eluded me in terms of answers. We have tried vented shelters. We have tried um, using heftier stakes. We have tried putting holes in shelters to increase ventilation. Um, I have a few remaining ideas that we're going to be working at over the years ahead. 
I have heard a number of people say, David, uh, what you need to do is let that tree move in its early development. These wooden stakes that you're using, particularly when you went to your one and a half by one and a half inch stakes, thinking we need stronger stakes to hold them up when they want to flop. He said, you need to let those trees move. When they move and they experience stress in their early stages, mm -hmm. there will be hormonal responses in their tissues that strengthen the stems. And essentially you're protecting them from the movement that would remedy the problem. So some people have said, uh, if you use a fiberglass stake that will flex in heavy winds and you know, whatever may be going on that uh, is leading them to move about. Uh, I've heard, I've heard one from woman from Vermont just in the last month say, I bet you're tying your zip ties really tightly. I said, yep, because we don't want the uh, wind to be shaking these things and abrading the stems. She said, I leave my ties loose, particularly the upper tie. And as that thing flops around, that has for me eliminated the flopping issue. I thought, can it be that simple? So we're gonna try some of that. Um, others have said, um, use a four foot tube, but around here, we can't do that so well. Um, trying to think what else. Oh, and I had one, one conscientious soul who went back with a case knife and cut four inch by six inch holes two of those and each and every shelter. He said, I saw these things overgrowing. I knew they were gonna to get to be unstable. He said, I cut those really large holes in and it shut them right down. They slowed down, they strengthened up and they didn't flop over. So, and I, I'm reluctant to put holes in that size because that's the size that cavity nesters will go in mm -hmm. and get trapped in there and die or it's the size that a deer will hook its horns in and rip the entire structure out of the ground. Um, so we haven't gone to that solution, but that's why we're trying the, the vented tubes and the extra, we, we actually custom drilled uh, seven eighth inch diameter holes, a series of eight of them trying to get increased airflow, uh, thinking it would slow them down, but it, it didn't get the job done. So great question, Carol. Um, try the fiberglass stakes. Um, try leaving the ties loose. Those are my next things I'm going to try. So that's, right. I, well, I'm sorry, I went off mute for a second. I'm sorry, because I just want to ask the end of the question. So, so that's, that's great, right? It all is on the principle that trees need to be uh, buffeted by the wind in order, as you say, to, to stimulate the hormones. <clears throat> but will a tree who started, who got to that point, uh, be able to strengthen if it's, if perhaps the tube is, you know, if it's given that shifting move, uh, ability to shift while being supported, do you know if it can recover? Yeah, and I, I think the best thing to do is to, is to take some of the weight off, you know, remove a lot of the side branches. That's a tremendous amount of work. Mm. Um, I've heard mixed reviews and you should talk to somebody like an arborist. If you were to actually coppice the thing and take the top out, so that you relieve that weight on there. You know, if you take the central leader out, I'm not sure. I've heard mixed reviews on whether that's advisable and whether that's going to create a structural instability later on the tree's life. Mm -hmm. At that point, I can't answer that. Uh, you can cause double leaders, but you can trim a double leader out. You know, mm -hmm. just come back and cut off one of the one of the sides. Thanks, so, David. Those are great but, points. Appreciate it. That's yeah, not an easy problem to solve. Once they flop, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Right, right. But I mean, that's one of the great things about the work that you're doing is that it, you're talking about evidence-based ways to improve survivability for these planted trees in a riparian buffer. And that's- We're know, sure trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done, you've done a lot on, uh, along those lines. So, um, okay, we have another question. Um, Chris asks, uh, farmland can be a, a major reason for having an impaired designated stream, as we all know. Uh, how have you been successful in convincing farmers to install riparian buffers? So, so, so how do you convert them 
yep. to rather than you know more more land for their crop or their livestock, how do you convince them to to put in a riparian buffer? The majority of folks that we interact with and work with, and and frankly, the majority of farmers on the landscape are people of goodwill and good conscience and have a conservation ethic that undergirds what they do. What is difficult is it's difficult for them uh, to be profitable in American agriculture today. Profitability is a serious, serious challenge. So typically we are approaching farmers, um, certainly covering the costs of buffers that they want to install and more often than not, we are incenting the installation of those buffers. For example, um, one of our projects right now is uh, we will do uh, the comprehensive nutrient management plan that is a complete roadmap. It's about a $15,000 cost to have an ag consultant go out, develop a complete strategy for comprehensively treating all of that farm's conservation needs as a roadmap to figure out what needs to be done, how much it's gonna cost. And that becomes a basis for an application to whether it's growing greener, PenVest, USDA, wherever, uh, those CNMPs they're called, that Comprehensive Nutrient Management Plan, that roadmap um, becomes a, a quick and ready way for an ag consultant then to queue that project up for public funding in order to, for the farmer to get that $15,000 plan from us for free, that we'll pay that, we ask that they do forested buffers at least 35 feet wide on all their streams. And we've had a, we've had a brisk trade in that concept. Years ago, we had um, created an incentive system where we gave the farmer $4,000 for every acre they put into forested buffers, but that $4,000 could only be spent to implement conservation practices as part of a conservation plan on the farm. Uh, other times when, when we control the resources, we'll simply say like when the, the Obama administration had the federal, uh, the American uh, Restoration and Recovery Act, the federal stimulus, uh, we tied into $14 million. I was working at Chesapeake Bay Foundation at that point. We worked with 43 farmers we said, we will pay for everything that your conservation plan calls for on the condition that you do forested buffers. And we had um, 113 farmers interested. We had three say, if I got to do a buffer, I'm not interested. The other 110 said, yeah, bring on the buffer. If that's the price of getting these funds, we'll do that. And um, we ended up doing 43 farms with the funding that we had, the 14 million and did a whole lot of buffers. So, so we incent it, you know, we, mm -hmm. we certainly, it, it requires the messenger has got to believe the message. Yeah. The ag consultant that does a lot of our work, this fellow did his master's thesis on forested buffers and he's an ag consultant. So he believes this, he believes that forested buffers are just part of a responsible modern farm um, approach to agriculture. And they're, they're, that's Team Ag Incorporated in Ephrata. And they are, they go on a farm and about eight out of 10 guys, they can talk into doing forested buffers when it's part of an overall funding package for all the conservation work that they need. So um, it takes a messenger that believes the message and it takes resources and it takes uh, an ability to meet the, meet the farmer on a economic basis that works for them. Mm -hmm. That's helpful, David. It, you know, a lot of our farms are already preserved under agricultural easements. So it's the challenge is coming up with the, the right kind of incentive that appeals to them. Yeah. David, thank you so much for uh, all the information you shared. It was, it was really, certainly I learned a lot. I think everyone online did. It was uh, gives us some new things to think about as we continue to uh, try to establish some some uh, riparian buffers, wooded buffers on some of the, the public lands that we own in North Coventry Township. So thank you for everything that you've uh, shared with us. Thank you, John, for the opportunity. And I, I'm 
again, uh, hats off to the souls who are here on, on uh, what would otherwise be a, a time to put your feet up and, and, and relax a bit. So uh, thank you for your commitment to your communities and to our environment. Uh, it's gonna take all of us doing some, some Herculean tasks in the years ahead to keep these, keep things on the rails for, for those that come after us. Indeed, it will. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and good night. Good night.